Um, we're going to talk about repentance and what is, what is repentance. Last week <clears throat> we spoke about it uh, a little bit and I will just recap a little bit on, on last week's message. Thank you, Vessel. On last week's message and what it is. Is there sound there? Okay, wonderful. <clears throat> um, last week we were talking about repentance, what repentance is. You know, so many times we think that repentance is you stop your sin so that God can forgive you. You think of people outside in the world, um, you know, that's never accepted Jesus, or people that sin, you know, they, they maybe uh, uh, go to a church and they're just in a traditional church and they live a life of drinking and smoking and, and um, you know, stealing and whatever, just a normal sinner's life. <clears throat> and uh, for years it's been preached in the church that if the, the person must repent from his sins so that God can forgive him of his sins, and then he must start to serve Jesus. Now that's a false doctrine. It's got nothing, that doctrine has got nothing to do with Jesus Christ. I want to say it boldly. Those of you that watch by the internet, I want to say it boldly. That doctrine is devilish. It's got nothing to do with the gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ is not man's effort to leave his sin to be accepted by God. The gospel, say it again, the gospel is not man's effort to stop his sin so that he can be acceptable to God. And then once you've left your sin and shown great remorse for your sin, now God will forgive you and accept you into his kingdom. And then from that day on you confess the name of Jesus, hoping that you don't sin again, so that when you die one day, you might be saved. (laughs) That is not the gospel, man. That is not the gospel of Jesus Christ. The word gospel means good news. That is not good news for any person. There are people out there, they've been trapped in their sins for so many years, and now, and they want to leave their sin, and now you come to them and tell them, listen, if you now just call on the name of Jesus, in other words, say, I'm a Christian, and stop your sins, and start to go to church, you're now going to be saved. That's not good news for him. That's why many people, and I, I did a lot of mission work um, under the colored people, and, and what I like about the colored people, they are straightforward. They don't try to hide anything. They say it the way it is. You ask somebody, do you want to receive Jesus now? And say, nie nog hier Isn't it? Yeah, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready yet to accept Jesus. Now, what is in his mind when he thinks that he's not ready yet to accept Jesus? What he's actually saying is, I don't feel the energy inside me that when I calculate my future, that I feel enough power now to leave my sin for the rest of my life. Because the focus is on man's ability and energy to be able to leave his sin. And then people come to a place where they realize, man, I'm really in a big mess, and I need, I'm so close to hell now, That I really need to leave my sin now. And then fear of hell motivates him to leave his sin. You know, the other day, somebody that believes in ultimate salvation, um, where you don't have to be saved by faith or, or believe in Jesus at all, that all the world is saved already, uh, wrote to me on, on Facebook and said to me, Bertie, you know, but uh, if you believe that people are going to go to hell, why are you not preaching day and night, knocking at people's doors, telling people they must now accept Jesus so they can be saved. Or preaching the gospel of grace that they can believe it and then be saved. Why am I not doing all of that? And God gave me a very good answer. And what came to my mind was a child, that's a, a young boy of, I saw this picture of, like standard two, playing rugby. And uh, they tackled him and he breaks his neck and he's paralyzed. You don't find the mom next to every rugby field for the rest of her life, with a big placard saying, this is the most dangerous sport in the world. Don't play it. Because it doesn't matter how bad a thing is, it doesn't have the power to motivate you like something that's good. So the fact that people are going to go to hell is not what motivates me to preach. What motivates me to preach is the truth about their innocence. (laughs) That gives me enough power to preach. Amen. So, uh, 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 this message of repentance and the idea of once I've had enough remorse, then God will forgive me is not the gospel. 
There's a difference between the, in the Greek, in the Afrikaans, and in the English, there's a difference between the word remorse and repent. Remorse means to feel very sorry. In Greek says to breathe deeply. <sighs> so jammer, so spite. So as iemand, you know, the woman caught in the act of adultery. Maybe she had, she was by a spite. Maybe not over what she had done, but because she was caught. You know? Then I say that in, Afri- in English, sorry. <laughs> the great remorse that, uh, not for what she's, she's done, but the fact that she was caught. And that is not what saves us. Repentance means a change of mind on how you get saved. Now, I want to just explain to you what Jesus Christ has done and then explain repentance. When Jesus was baptized, the Bible says when Jesus was baptized, He says, I will be baptized. You can John the Baptist to be baptized. John the Baptist said to Him, I cannot let you baptize me. I need to be baptized by you. Now, the word, let me explain baptism. Baptism of that time was not something you had to do to get saved. It was a sign that I wash off all that I believed before, and now I'm baptized, if you say with the baptism of John, it means I become now a disciple of John. And I believe, and from now on I will be trained in the doctrine he preaches. So what it actually was, it was a sign of changing your belief. Now, for the Jews, why didn't the Pharisees want to baptize, get baptized? The reason why the Pharisees didn't want to baptize themselves or get baptized with the baptism of John was John's baptism was the baptism of the sinner. You had to repent of your sin, saying, I am a sinner. And I declare that whatever I've been doing before this, remember, only the Jews was baptized there with John's baptism, declaring that the way I was seeking salvation by the law <laughs> rendered me a sinner. Cannot save me. I'm waiting for someone who can pardon my sin. Because me, being sorry for my sin, bringing this physical lamb to be slain and whatever, can never make me clean. I am still standing as a sinner. Now, if you go and read the book of uh, uh, Galatians, you will see Paul says that we are not sinners, talking about from a, a Jewish perspective, that we are Jews and not sinners of the Gentiles. Because they saw all the Gentiles as sinners and the Jews as not sinners. So what they actually had to do by confessing I'm a sinner, saying I place myself in the level of a Gentile. Now where is a Jew going to do that? Especially a Pharisee. I mean, you come to a Pharisee, you'll tell him, do you have sin? He will say, I've got no sin. Because I've just had the lamb slain. And I've, I, I fast and I pray and everything and everything. Like Jesus said to the rich young ruler, follow the law. He said, I've done it since my youth. He was not sin conscious. He was just thinking, well, I don't have sin. You know, right now, because I'm following these laws. That's why Jesus raised the standard so they could see their sin, because they couldn't see sin. They were thinking, no, I'm fine. You know? (laughs) So here, they, they had to get baptized in the baptism of John, meaning that I've got to confess that I am a sinner. And then somebody, two days before, two days before, walked past there and John said, look at the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then Jesus got baptized with what baptism? The baptism of the sinner. Baptizing himself into the sin of the people. Carrying the sin of the people. My goodness. Because John said, Jesus said to John, let me be baptized so that we can fulfill all righteousness. So being baptized, he fulfilled all righteousness. Because baptism was, I am taking, Jesus wasn't the sinner. So the only thing he could do, if he came with the baptism of John, he didn't have any sin to confess. So when he was baptized, what happened? He received, at that point he became the high priest of mankind and all the sin of man was all of a sudden not anymore represented in the individual but in the man Jesus 
So then he was carrying the sin of the world. In representation. Okay? Carrying the sin of the world. Then in, in, in Matthew chapter 9, we can go there. Let's go to Matthew 9. This is an awesome verse. Matthew chapter 9. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Tell you, this is, you're going to be so blessed. Matthew 9, Jesus comes to a man that's paralyzed. Paralyzed guy. Or they brought him to Jesus. Jesus said to the man, he saw that they, got, they had faith that Jesus could heal him. So what it means is they persuaded that what he's got, there's something in him. Then Jesus said these words, Be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven you. In Afrikaans says, Your sonde is jou vergewe. Your sins are forgiven. He, 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 did he confess sin? Never. He never confessed any sin. But why could Jesus say to him, Your sins are removed from you? Because in the baptismal waters, it has been removed from the individual to the Lamb which would then three years later be slain for the sins that he's carrying of the world. And while he was on the earth, he was just saying, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. There's a woman caught in the very act of adultery, in the very act. Jesus said, I don't condemn you, before she confessed. So that means that Stopping your sin is not what removes your sin from you. I, that means repenting from your sin is not what makes you innocent. It means that your innocence will make you repent from your sin. I hope you hear what I'm saying. You will not be able to stop your sin unless you have first been set free from your sin. Your revelation of freedom is what sets you free. It's not your, you setting yourself free from your sin that will set you free from your sin. You've been set free from your sin. When you believe in that, you are set free from your sin. I hope it makes sense. Yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's read Matthew 9, verse 1. I wish the whole world could hear me now. And he entered into a ship and passed over and came... Uh, to his own city, and behold, they brought to him a man sick of, of the palsy, lying on a bed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said unto the sick. So the people that brought him had faith. Here was the sick man. He's just like, where are you taking me? Where are you taking me? Okay. So their faith, uh, um, and, and he said to the man of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemes. Okay. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think you evil in your hearts? Now listen to that. Jesus said to this man that's paralyzed, that hasn't even spoken a word to Jesus, I tell you, your sins has been divorced from you, if you read the Greek. Your sins has been divorced. How does divorce work? Divorce is when I end the contract between two people. So God came in Christ and ended the contract between that person and God as pertaining to sin. Because the contract was now signed between Jesus and God as pertaining to the sin of the world. Okay. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> oh, I enjoy this. So, so here, here he was and he said, Why are you... Sadducees and Pharisees thinking evil in your heart. Now what were they thinking? They were thinking this man blasphemes by calling this guy that is paralyzed not a sinner. Because he was bearing the proof of his sin in his body. Because the Bible says in Deuteronomy 28 verse 15, if you don't do my works, then these sicknesses will come over you. So he is such a big sinner that he's even carrying the proof of his sin, which is paralysis, in his body. Now Jesus comes in the presence of the proof, in the presence of no confession, and declares to him, 
Your sins has been divorced from you. The contract that brings the sickness, the, 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 which is disobedience to the law, and the contract that you've got with the law, you've been divorced from it. You are standing as pertaining to the law, innocent before God. Now what does that say to the Jew's mind? My goodness, then that means I can now walk. Because I'm not allowed to have this curse on me. <laughs> because it's been removed from me. That's why Jesus said, what's easier to say? Take up your bed and walk, or to say, your sins are forgiven you. It's the same thing. For the Jew, it's the same thing in his mind. It's the same thing. Equally difficult or equally easy. Now, when, when I preach and I say that Jesus has already removed the sin of the world from people, people will differ from me. But that very same person will confess that God can heal somebody that's never accepted Jesus. Why is he healed? Why can he be healed? Because his sin has been removed from him. What's easier to say to a person who's never accepted Jesus, be healed in the name of Jesus, or to say to him, your sins are forgiven. But we've been so traumatized <laughs> with, 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 this, with, with a message of condemnation that we cannot declare to people, your sins are forgiven. We cannot say those words. We can say, be healed. But we can't say, your sins are forgiven. No, 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 no. For you are only forgiven once you've repented. That's not true. But Bertie, the Bible says, if you confess your sin, then God is faithful and just to forgive you all your sins and cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. Now we will get into that. Amen. That's going to be a nice one to answer. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now just think of that. Now, here's the Lamb of God. This is still part of last week's message. Here's the Lamb of God carrying the sin of the world. While He carries it, so sin... He's still represented in him. And he declares people innocent. Okay. Now, then he went and died with that sin. So he became sin. Then he took the punishment of sin, the judgment of sin. John chapter 12. I didn't come into this world to judge the world, but to be judged. And if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all. And then in the Greek, it doesn't say men. It says judgment. I will draw all judgment unto me. So when he was, he came in for judgment, and the point of judgment for his sin was upon the cross. When he was lifted up, what happened? Then God judged sin in the body of Jesus. With what? With his fire, okay? With his, 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 his unquenchable fire, and his, his wrath, and whatever. And what happened to sin? It was completely and utterly destroyed forevermore. Because God did a good job. <laughs> he didn't punish sin to the point of, 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 of um, how can I say, <clears throat> He didn't punish sin to the point of, okay, now I feel a bit better, but I'll beat them later tomorrow again. No, no, He punished it all. Amen. He punished it all in the body of Jesus. Isn't that awesome? So that there was nothing left. You know when you burn a piece of paper, you'll find ashes. But after God was finished with sin, there was not even ashes. It was finished. It died. You know when something dies, it is gone forevermore. The life of that thing. You know if, 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 if somebody, or if, if a flower is alive and it dies, there's no more life in that thing. It has been, sin died. That's why today, the wonderful thing, and I want to just throw this in, even though you go through, the, in the time of Jesus, and afterwards, even now, we can find signs and wonders, and we can see people being healed, and being touched supernaturally by the power of God. I believe in that, I pray for the sick, we see miracles. But even if you should not be healed, we are not defined by these things. We are defined by the resurrected life of Jesus. It's like I said to one of my friends one day, because, and, I, and I've shared this here before, uh, um, he, he lost his one leg and then wanted God to give him a leg, and he didn't get a leg. And then he decided not to believe in God anymore. 
So I said to him, listen, my friend, don't decide not to believe in God. Let's just wait until Jesus comes, man. You know? <laughs> or pass away, you know? And then in 200 years from now or so, we talk about this thing again. <laughs> because now we want to argue about things without having all the right knowledge. So let's just wait until we've got all the knowledge before we come to our conclusion. That's true. I mean, we cannot think in the parameters of this world. We are, not of, we, we are in this world, but we're not of this world. So we cannot reason within the parameters of this world. We can only reason within the parameters of the kingdom of God and eternity. Hallelujah. Amen. So if you lost your business, if your husband decided to divorce you, if your wife passed away, if something like that happened, yes, we will, we will feel hurt in our heart. Yes, we are still in this world. And the things of this world will touch us. But we're not of this world. So our conclusion cannot be made within these parameters. It's impossible. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. So here, here, here Jesus comes. He declares innocence. Now think of Jesus. He died on the cross. He removed sin. He just utterly destroyed it. So when he was on the earth and sin was still represented in him, and he comes to a person and say, your sins are forgiven, where was the sin? He was carrying the sin. But now, when we come, where's the sin? We can, how much more can we now declare the forgiveness of sins than when Jesus declared it when he was on the earth? Because this is even after the judgment of sin. So that people can believe this good news. <laughs> Isn't it? This is the gospel. They can believe this good news when they believe this and repent. Repent of what? Of what they believed. Yeah, change their mind on their way of salvation. We're going to see that in Jonah now. Change their mind on the way they get saved. If they can change their mind on that, then they will see the new way and their hearts will not see sin anymore but be cleansed. Amen. By what Christ has done. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Right, let's get into some of the scriptures here. Go to 1 John chapter 5. Sorry, 1 John chapter 1. How long have I preached there? Okay. Thank you. Now this verse is... is, is, is um, troubled many people not understanding this now I want to say this to you it's very important to take this message and the previous message listen to it, meditate upon it because this thing will stretch your belief system it will stretch you it will make your brain stretch a bit and if you if, if you don't watch out what, what, what the Bible prophesies, there are those that look and marvel and go away and despise. You know? Because it is so good that while you listen to it, you're blown away. When you go away, you, you start to think along other lines and say, but it can't be. Go and listen to it again and again and again. I mean, it took me years of hearing the good news to be able to believe this. Because my heart wouldn't allow it. My heart wouldn't allow to say that somebody is innocent. Because I was, th I, I was not knowing how innocence works. Let me explain this, this innocence quickly. If I've got a contract, uh, um, uh, uh, I had a contract, I rented an office from somebody. So we ended that contract. Okay? There are certain things that we had to meet. We wanted to end the contract a year before it, it expired. So I had to pay certain monies. I paid it and everything and the contract ended. Now, this month, it's the first, first month I don't have to pay there. Now I don't pay. End of this month, I'm not going to pay then. No, but that, I mean, is that wrong? No, it's not wrong. Why? As pertaining to that contract, it has ended. But I rented other offices, uh, other storage place where, where I store all my equipment and stuff. 
And that I had to do when I, when I ended this year, I had to rent another place. So should I pay there? Yes. If I don't pay here, am I guilty? No, because that contract has ended. I'm innocent as pertaining to this contract. So Jesus Christ rendered people innocent as pertaining to righteousness by works. For there's a different way in which He judges us. He looks at us from the perspective of faith, believing in what He's done. End of it. Amen. First John. It says here... <coughs> Verse 5. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. This then is the message which we heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of God of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Okay? If we walk in the light as He is in the light, then the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Now, has Jesus already paid for the sin of the world? Yes. But how does this now cleanse us from our sin? Now, remember there it says, the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from our sins. Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 9. So there's something you need to do in order for the blood of Jesus to cleanse you from your sin. Now what is the cleansing of sin? Now I want to explain that in the New Testament, the cleansing of sin. Because we think that we, we, we are, and how does this cleansing work? And let me tell you, the sin that people commit, that people are guilty of before God, is rejection of Christ or unbelief in Jesus. Th that is the sin. But sins, like you've lied, you've cheated, you've did this, 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 that cannot separate you from God. It's impossible. Okay? Now let's see Hebrews 9. Remember what we read there? If you walk in the light as He is in the light, then the blood of Christ will cleanse you of all your sin. Hebrews 9, 14. Oh, yes. How much more then shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. I hope you hear what I'm saying there. He said, listen to this. If you walk in the light as he is in the light, what is the light? It's the revelation of grace. If you walk in the revelation of Jesus as he is in that revelation, in other words, if you walk in what he believes, then the blood of Jesus will cleanse you of all your sin. Hebrews, uh, Hebrews 9.14 How much more shall the blood of Jesus cleanse your mind of wicked works? So what is sin? Or dead works? Sin is the works mentality in your mind. So when you come and confess Jesus as your Lord... Who he, what He has done and who He is will cleanse your mind from the thought pattern of sin consciousness and works mentality. For the sin is man's, uh, man's effort to be sinless before God. That's sin. He will cleanse you when you confess Him as Lord. Now listen to what First John, uh, let's go back to First John there. Are you hearing what I'm saying here? <laughs> I've got to listen to this again, man. There's good news. Yeah, hallelujah. First John. Let me repeat myself. What I said in First John chapter 1, verse 7, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, then the blood of Christ will cleanse us from our sins. Now He says, with the blood of bulls and goats had a certain effect, but how much more shall the blood of Jesus cleanse us, cleanse our minds from wicked works. So here he says, the blood of Jesus cleanses you from your sin. Here it says, the blood of Jesus cleanses you from your wicked works in your mind. Or not wicked works, dead works. It's the difference between 
bad works and dead works or wicked works. Dead works is the works that is formed from the ministration of death, which is written on stones, which is the Ten Commandments. So the work that says you must do this for God to bless you, and you're doing that work, even if you get it right, it is a very good work born from the ministration of death called a dead work. So somebody that tithes, for instance, you're giving your tithes, but you give your tithes so that you can be blessed because you believe the Bible commands you to do it. If I do it, then I'll be blessed. If I don't do it, I'll be cursed. And you tithe faithfully, you are faithfully busy with a dead work. That's it. You're faithfully busy with a dead work. Now it says, and that is called sin. If God says, I'll make you righteous, and you say, God, give me a chance that I can be righteous by my works, is that sin? Even if what you do is good. It's a sin. Now the word sin comes from, it means to miss the mark. You are missing the target. You're not, you, you're not going in the direction planned by God. Now that sin of trying by your own works will bring forth many sins in your life. Like fornication, adultery, outburst of wrath, anger, la 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 la. You can read them in, in, in uh, Galatians 5 from verse 17 on. The fruit of being in the flesh or being under works righteousness. Now it's, so here it says, the blood of Christ will cleanse me of all my sin. Now it says, but the blood of Christ will cleanse my mind of all the wicked works. So what, what is the sin that he will cleanse you from? The wicked works in your mind. Let's read verse, uh, 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 1 John 1 again. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we say, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. There were people that said, I don't have sin. He says, listen, if you say you have no sin, if you are saying that well, I don't need any salvation from Jesus. The truth is not in you. So what's part of the truth? Acknowledging that I, by my own works, can never be saved. I mean, a consciousness of Jesus and what is done and my inability, right? If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin, to divorce us from our sin and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Now, what does that mean? If I, if I confess my sin, what is the sin that is talked about here? My wicked works? My dead works by which I was thinking I'll be justified before God? These people thought they had no sin. Why? Because they were obeying all the laws and the commandments. If you come to the rich young ruler and you tell him, listen, you've got sin, and he says, he will say, I've got no sin. I have obeyed the law from my youth. Then he will say, if you can confess your sin, what sin? <laughs> that Jesus says that you don't have the ability, but you say, I do have the ability by my own works. If you can confess that, if you can see that and change metanoia, change your mind and believe the truth, you will find who He is will cleanse your mind from this wicked, dead way of seeing God. That plus the fruit of that, which is sins, will be removed from you. If we can realize that the ministration of death written on stones in the minds of people is the source of all sin, if we can realize that man's effort to be righteous before God by his works is the origin of sin in his life then we'll understand this because God says I will remove I, I will cleanse you from all unrighteousness in other words unrighteousness is where you think I don't have the right to have 
The people think, I don't have the right to have this. I don't have the right to have this. But He will cleanse you of all of that. Where you will say, but I've got the right because of Jesus. I'm not unrighteous. I've got the right now. I am righteous. Let, let me use the word righteousness in its true context. The word righteousness means uh, uh, there's works of righteousness and then there's righteousness. Righteousness means to weigh up to the standard. So He will cleanse you of everything where you think you don't weigh up. And will come and teach you how you weigh up. He will cleanse your mind from all the dead works that you were thinking and pondering on, seeking the justification before God. And by doing that, He will remove all sins from you. Because by that works mentality, sin was coming forth in your life. Because the Paul clearly states that when I was thinking of the law that I should not desire, I found desire growing in me. So when Paul says, and I mean, when John writes, he says, God will cleanse my mind of wicked works. That includes the power of sin in your life. So it's not me repenting from my sins that saved me, but me repenting of my wrong belief and being baptized into Jesus. That's why Paul said, clearly in Romans 6, he says, you've been all baptized into His death. So when we baptize people, we say, you are baptized, and I mean, in Christ they've already been baptized into that, but when they come in, in, in acknowledgement, we baptize them into what? John baptized them into sin confession. What do we baptize them into? We baptize you and say, you are unified in the death of Christ. When one died, then all are dead. So you are baptized into that, meaning from now on I'm following after the doctrine that He died my death, He destroyed my sin, He removed my sin from me. I'm baptized into that and I am from today a disciple of that doctrine. Hallelujah. You must still young. Huh? Don't you agree? Amen. That's how forgiveness works. Now let's go to Jonah. If you can put the projector on for me, Vessel. And uh, before we get to Jonah, let's go just to Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10. Let's talk a little bit more about this forgiveness thing and what the Hebrew people understood under forgiveness. From verse 1. For the law having a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Okay, so what does he say here? The sacrifices of the Old Testament could not make the people perfect. Could not. Okay. Why couldn't it make them perfect? For then would they not have ceased to be offered if the Old Testament way of seeking righteousness before God was perfect. Then you would offer it once and be finished. Okay. But because they could not make the comer perfect, that's why it has to be offered year by year. But in those sacrifices there is, oh sorry verse 2, for then would they not cease to be offered because the worshippers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sin. Okay, so where, where does, when I confess my sin, where does it wash me? Does it wash my sin away between me and God? Or does it, my, does it wash my consciousness of sin between me and God? It washes your consciousness. Because your sins has been removed in the Lamb of God. But now you are sin conscious. And you live as a sinner. And with a condemnation mind, you find a lot of suffering in your life, a lot of guilt, a lot of condemnation, a lot of seeking breakthrough, seeking this, seeking that, and many other things, hoping for this, hoping for that, and whatever, working so hard to please God, to qualify, but when you, when you confess your sin, your wrong belief, say the same thing, let's confess, homo logos, speaking the same word about my sin, if I can say what God says about my, my sin and my unbelief and my way of seeking God, which is not the wrong one, then I will find when I can, you will only find the effect of something in your life once you can 
acknowledge, let, let me explain it this way. Um, say I come and, and, and somebody comes to me and says to me, listen man, Bertie, um, your son, I, I will pay for him to go to some very big school in, in the country, you know? And you can send him there, it's the best education, best sport, best, 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 best. Okay? As long as what I still believe, this school is the best for my child, that can have no effect on me. But the moment I can confess that this is not the best, then that other word can only affect me. That other person might have paid for the school fees already. But my belief manifests that truth in my life. So when I confess my error, when I could say, but this is not the best for my child, I should do that. Because maybe I was thinking in a certain framework of mind, you know, that would, uh, uh, um, that would not allow me to send my child there. But now that my mind is changing, I am metanoia, I am, the, the, another word for, for repentance, the word reconsider. I am reconsidering this thing. I'm reconsidering the way I thought was good for my child. And when I saw the other way, and I got persuaded of that, it had influence in my life. It cleansed my mind from this wicked way of thinking, which I thought was the truth. So when you hear the truth, you confess. Say the same thing as what God says about your human effort to be right before God. Amen. So here in Hebrews 10 it says that the comers, once purged, should have no more conscience of sin. Purged of what? Purged of sin consciousness. Purged of the law system. If you can believe the once purging of Jesus. Now let's verse 14, 10 verse 14. It says they will have a consciousness of sin. Why? Because that animal sacrifice could not make them perfect. But now it says here in verse 14, for by, for by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. So he has perfected forever them that are sanctified by his blood. How are we sanctified by his blood? By walking in the light as he is in the light. What does that mean? Believing what Jesus believes about you will change your mind, cleanse your mind from every wicked, dead work you think you had to do to be pleasing to God. And you'll find the fruit of the Holy Spirit manifesting in your life. Right. Um, Esau, Jonah. Let's talk about repentance. Jonah went and preached. Jonah 3. Right. <clears throat> Listen to this. Read a bit New Testament. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, the great city, and preach it, and preach unto it, the preaching that I bid thee. Preach unto it, 853, Alpha Omega, Al Leftaf. <laughs> which is not translated, you know. They, 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 they tried to make it it. It's just a sign. It cannot be translated into English. Just go to a, a, a BDB there vessel. Um, yes, click on that word there. A sign of the definite direct object not translated in English. Okay. So that, that's not right. Translation is wrong. Because it's the Hebrew characters, for those of you that see it for the first time, Olive Tav. That was in the old, old uh, translation. That, that was the picture of an ox. And this was the ancient, ancient Hebrew. And that was the picture of a cross. The sacrifice upon the cross. Okay, right. Now let's read. <laughs> Arise and go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it. The sacrifice upon the cross. The preaching that I bid thee. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. So Jonah rose and went unto Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Uh, Thank you. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city. Um, great city of three days journey. And Jonah began enter, enter into the city a day's journey. And he cried and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So what was he saying? There was, and I want to say this, 
um, to me, this was Jesus, you know, talking about Jesus, the three days in the whale, coming out, preaching the gospel, and in 40 days the city will be overthrown. Talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit that will come, overthrowing the city of Nineveh. <laughs> Amen. Right. Was was no. So the people of Nineveh believed God. They believed and proclaimed the fast and put sackcloth from, uh, from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh and he arose from his throne and he laid a ro uh, his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in, the, in ashes. Okay, As he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his noble saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock taste anything, let them not feed nor drink water. Now what does that mean? So here he says, listen, I proclaim that there's going to become an end, end to this system the way it is now. Then the king believed in all the people. They repented. What did they repent? They believed the word. What word? Remember, we must interpret this into the New Testament. The word of the sacrifice upon the cross. That was their repentance. Saying, I see that that way, the way I was following is not the right way. I'm believing in another way now. Okay? And then he says, they shall not eat or drink. Now to me, this is my just a typology. What I believe about that was, they declared, we shall not eat anymore what, we've, I mean, what they've always been eating. What have they always been eating? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They've been eating their normal food, which came from the law system. And that, that's it. So they repented and said, we are now believing this and not eating what we've always been eating. Remember what Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood and you shall be saved. So we take this into the New Testament. You guys need to repent. So they repented. How did they repent? They believed on the new way. They believed on this word that God gave them to preach. And then they stopped to eat. That's what a fast is. The Bible says, isn't this the fast that I have chosen? Isaiah 58. Isn't this the fast that I've chosen? To lose the bonds of wickedness. In other words, it means a fast is when you stop to eat something and then you are set free. What is that fast? You stop to eat this law system of works righteousness and then you set free. Isn't this fast to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, the day, the, I mean, the, the, this day of God, if you can read Isaiah 58? That's his fast. What's fasting? Fasting means when I don't eat and I see the deliverance of God. Yeah. I stop to eat the law system and I see the deliverance of God. Amen. And now we are under hunger strikes. Right. Okay, but let, but let man be, be covered with sackcloth and cry mighty unto God. And yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way. I like that. Turn from his evil way. Jesus said to those people that couldn't declare the other people innocent, He says, why do you think evil in your heart? Declare, return from your evil way. We only see this in the, in the context of sins. Get sins out of your mind. Get the biggest sin there is into your mind, which is works, righteousness, my effort before God. That is an evil way. The Bible says there's a way that seems unto life, but the end is death. Paul declared that way in Romans 7, where he said, I found that this commandment which, which seemed to be unto life was unto death. He's quoting the Ten Commandments. Then they repented of their evil way. And from the violence that is in their hands. I mean that evil way brings violence to your hands. Where you deal with people in a harsh way. Judging, condemning, throwing them with stones. Okay. Who can tell if God... Uh, uh, chapter 9 to the top please. Thank you. Who can tell if God will turn and repent. And turn away from His fierce anger. That we perish not. And God saw... Listen, and God saw Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. And God saw the ox on the cross. 
that they turned from their evil way. So he saw how they accepted Christ and didn't punish them. Isn't that awesome? They didn't know what it was. You must remember the Bible says Jesus, Jesus came and he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega in Revelations. And he was meaning by that just beginning and end as well. But as we studied, this word is, 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 is the word that's used the most in the Bible. It's used over 7,000 times. Yeah. Over 7,000 times. And not translated because it's just a sign. It, 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 it's a sign in English. But generally preceding and indicating the accusative. We can also go to, um, go to, the, go to Strong's quickly. Let me show them. Okay. Uh, it comes from that word in a demonstrative sense, properly of self, but generally used to point out more, more definitely the object of a verb or a preposition, even or namely, as such unrepresented in English. So in English, you cannot say it in English. Okay. Right, let's go to that word. Double click, Hanes and 226. Let me just read it for you. It might be small. It says here, um, from... Double to five in the sense of appearing a signal as a flag, a beacon, a monument. Amen. I'm not sucking out of my thumb. There it is. <laughs> Hallelujah. So here is the sign. So then Jesus saw, then God saw the sign with the people. For they've repented from their way and then he saw his way. Jesus is called the way. His way with them and said, no, they cannot be punished. For they have repented and accepted the sacrifice. So repentance is not you stopping your sin so that you can be forgiven. Repentance is you changing your belief, thinking that you must stop your sin to be forgiven. And then you'll find the Holy Spirit setting you free from your sins. And you will live a holy life because God lives in you. This is, I won't tell you, might sound complicated, but this is the only way to a righteous, holy life. Because we are, we, we are standing for a good, good moral conduct, a holy life. That's why we preach this with boldness and believe this, for this is the only way to see God manifest in our life. And in Acts 17, Paul clearly states, he preaches to the people that believe in all the false gods. He says, in the times of old, God overlooked the ignorance, but is calling all people now to repentance. They believed in this God, they believed in that God, God called to repentance, to believe in what He's done for us. Hallelujah. Amen. So the sins the Bible talks about that you'll be washed from is your evil way of thinking. When you can confess Jesus as your Lord, you will find when He's your Lord and the way He does things, that changes my mind from all those evil things I think I had to do to get God to bless me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just go to the top there again. Verse 2. Okay. Um, arise and go to Nineveh. This one. It's so beautiful. And preached unto it. Where's 2 now? Sorry. Okay. And preached unto it. The preaching. And preached unto them. Aleph Taf, which is the preaching that I have but thee. Now, he didn't understand the cross and all those type of things. These things, it was just types and shadows. He didn't know. He just, God's going to destroy you in 40 days. You must come right. He didn't understand nothing of the gospel. They were just scared. But the Holy Spirit has hidden all these beautiful truths inside it. Joseph Prince says it this way. He says, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings to search it out. Amen. Now that can be seen in two ways. God finds glory therein to cover your sin. But man's find glory, man finds glory therein to expose your sin. You know? But I also believe it's a wonderful thing to study out the Scriptures. And to see the truth of Jesus in the scriptures. 
You know, when we sang that song, How Great Is Our God. L listen, man, you read this, and how can you but say, How Great Is Our God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. That neither death nor life, in, in Romans 8, neither death nor life can separate me. Neither thing that is or was or is to come can ever separate me from this love of God. So if I'm poor, if I'm rich, if I go through good times, bad times, it's no indication of the love of God towards me. For His love was demonstrated in this, that the Lamb of God took away the sin of the world, that we forevermore, in the return of Christ, can have immortality and reign with Him as kings and shine as light in an immortal body. All the doing of God. To Him be all the glory forevermore.